Greetings, and welcome back to the channel as we continue to delve into the world of science fiction cinema and one of the truly groundbreaking films of the genre. Metropolis is a turning point that has inspired filmmakers, cinephiles, and film students, but also one that was initially a financial failure, leading to being massacred in the editing booth. The original copy was lost until 2008. It was partially denounced by its creator, praised by Nazi leadership, and criticized by famous writers. Over the years, negatives have been rediscovered, leading to Metropolis becoming more than just a film, but a movement for archivists and documentarians. And that's one of the problems for a new channel like mine covering the history of sci-fi film. What new information can I bring to a subject that has been covered extensively over the years? In the end, maybe it's not about finding a different angle, but putting together many of the pieces to understand the cultural movements that created the novel and then the film, to the impact the film had on future filmmakers, cinephiles, and sci-fi fans. Towards the end of the silent era, Fritz Lang's Metropolis a German silent film from 1927 influenced how we see science fiction and what we should expect from the genre. It was a film that demanded more from its audience than what even Hollywood could produce at the time, and in some cases, even today. This was one of the films that helped create the rules we know today and set a new standard, even if, in 1927, it was perceived as an overbudgeted mess that financiers edited to the point of drastically changing the film's tone and message. Portions of the film were lost for many years, and it has gone through many reconstructions as new footage, once lost photographs, and original notes were discovered. The aftermath of World War I left a deep-rooted mark on society. Economies were reshaping, and the world was on the brink of significant change. Art and architecture were evolving at such a rapid pace, the modernist cultural movements were taking hold. Against this backdrop, the film industry was undergoing a revolution of its own. Silent cinema was still the norm, but the tantalizing possibility of synchronized sound would be presented to audiences in 1927 setting the stage for a worldwide cinematic transformation. Science fiction films throughout history, particularly starting with Fritz Lang's visionary metropolis, are not just creations made to entertain the masses. They are gateways into a turbulent world, undergoing profound transformation. To truly appreciate its significance, it is essential to step back into the historical context of the time. Post-World War I Germany was a nation grappling with economic collapse, political upheaval, and a profound sense of disillusionment. The Treaty of Versailles and the War Guilds Clause laid the blame on the war entirely on Germany and, to a lesser extent, her allies. And so, its call for heavy reparations only deepened the country's anger towards the victors. Hyperinflation ran rampant, rendering the German Reichmark virtually worthless. This economic turmoil seeped into the film's narrative, casting a stark divide between the upper class and the suffering working masses. While at the same time, a cultural renaissance was underway. German Expressionism developed after the war characterized by its distorted visuals and exploration of psychological deaths, was at its zenith. This was one artistic movement that Metropolis would embrace. But the influence of the Bauhaus School, founded by Walter Gropius in 1919, also permeated the film. The Bauhaus ethos, which championed the fusion of art, craft, and technology, found its way into the architectural elements and aesthetics. Not only Bauhaus and German Expressionism, but also Art Deco influenced the film in its visual design and architecture, particularly in the portrayal of the towering futuristic cityscape. The film's sleek geometric and symmetrical structures, with their use of streamlined curves and metallic surfaces, 
captured the essence of the movement, creating an iconic and timeless visual aesthetic that continues to inspire art and design to this day. German cinema itself was undergoing a revolution. Experimentation and innovation from filmmakers like F.W. Murnau and Robert Wien having already explored the artistic potential of the medium. Their works, Nosferatu and The Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, respectively, laid the groundwork for Fritz Lang's ambitious project. Unfortunately, it wasn't just the arts that thrived in Germany at this time. The Weimar Republic was racked with political chaos and ideological clashes. Radical movements like communism and fascism were vying for supremacy. And this unrest is reflected in Metropolis through its portrayal of the oppressed workers and the autocratic elite. During this complex socio-political landscape, Lang embarked on the creation of Metropolis, which in the end wasn't just a film. It reflected the world it emerged from and is a mirror to our own. All of this from a film that was a box office failure in 1927. It makes you wonder what films that fail to make an impact today could go on to influence future filmmakers and audiences. And just a quick side note, if you're enjoying this video, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing for more history of sci-fi content. Your support means a lot to this channel as it continues to grow, and I am continually grateful for all your support. Austrian director Fritz Lang, born in 1890, worked primarily in Germany until fleeing to the United States after an alleged meeting with Nazi propaganda minister Joseph Goebbels. Lang's career in German cinema, besides the classic Metropolis, included such films as Dr. Mabuza the Gambler from 1922, Die Nibelung from 1924, Woman in the Moon from 1929, M from 1931, The Testament of Dr. Mabuza from 1933. But it was when he traveled to New York in 1924 for the premiere of Die Nibelungen that he was hit with the inspiration for Metropolis. Lang said of the city, The buildings seem like a vertical curtain, shimmering and weightless, an opulent staged backdrop set against a sinister sky in order to dazzle, divert, and hypnotize. But before getting into the behind the scenes and legacy of the film, let's look at its core, the story. The film unfolds in the sprawling city of Metropolis. Director Fritz Lang and screenwriter Thea von Harbe envisioned a sprawling futuristic city divided into two distinct realms. Above ground, the wealthy elite, including Jo Fredrickson, the city's ruler, inhabit opulent skyscrapers, enjoying lives of luxury and excess. Below the surface, workers toil relentlessly in the dark in cavernous factories powering the city's machinery. Simultaneously, the film introduces his son, Freder, who falls in love with Maria, a charismatic worker. She advocates for peace, unity, and equality between the city's two classes. Maria's rallying cry for a heart to mediate between the head, the elite, and the hands, the workers, resonates deeply with the downtrodden masses. Their romance adds a layer of personal connection to the broader narrative, symbolizing the potential for love to bridge the class divide and fuels the workers' yearning for unity. Interwoven with this central narrative is the captivating subplot involving Rotwang a brilliant but obsessed inventor. Rotwang's motivation is to resurrect his lost love, Hell, by creating a robotic duplicate. The name Hell was deleted in the American version because it sounded too much like the Christian Hell. This subplot introduces an eerie and uncanny element, exploring the intricate web of human identity and the perils of unchecked ambition. But the creation of a robotic duplicate of Maria plays a pivotal role in the story as it is used to manipulate and incite violence among the workers, highlighting the consequences of technology in the wrong hands. As the workers' discontent for their oppressive circumstances grow, 
the focus on the uprising takes center stage. Under Maria's charismatic leadership, they unite and march towards a confrontation with the elite. This underscores the film's central themes of class struggle and inequality, mirroring the real-world tensions of the era. Ultimately, the film masterfully combines its central narrative with these subplots, resulting in a cinematic masterpiece that explores societal disparities, the human condition, and the potential for reconciliation and unity. Metropolis stands as the epitome of German Expressionist cinema, a movement that thrived on distorting reality to evoke heightened emotions and psychological depth. The film's visual language is a mesmerizing dance of sharp angles, jagged lines, and exaggerated forms, emphasizing the stark division between the opulent upper world and the oppressive underground. The intricate set design, courtesy of Otto Honte, Eric Kettelholt, and Karl Wolbrecht, is a towering achievement, with the city of Metropolis serving as a character within the film. Its skyscrapers and catacombs are a testament to the sheer grandeur and complexity of the sets, an artistic feat that continues to all audiences today. Cinematographer Carl Freund adds a layer of brilliance through the use of light and shadow, creating a visual chiaroscuro effect that heightens the sense of mystery and dread. The interplay of light and darkness not only adds depth to the visuals, but also mirrors the moral ambiguity of the characters and the city's stark divisions. Fritz Lang employed pioneering special effects techniques, such as miniatures and matte paintings, to achieve spectacular visuals from the flooding of the underground city to the intricate shots of the machine room. But Metropolis is not just a visual spectacle. It's a tapestry of symbolism and iconography. From the all-seeing eye of Horus to the Moloch machine that devours workers, these symbols are woven into the narrative, enriching the film's thematic depth. The film's costume design, too, reflects the class divide in Metropolis with the upper class donning elegant futuristic attire while the workers are clad in drab utilitarian clothing. Maria's iconic transformation from an ethereal angelic figure to a seductive robot showcases the power of costume design in conveying character evolution. Echoing not only the socio-political climate of the 1920s Weimar Republic, but also our own world's ongoing struggles and aspirations. It transcends time and cultural boundaries, addressing themes that remain as relevant today as they were nearly a century ago. Metropolis explores the ethical dilemmas of unchecked ambition, personified in the character of Rotwang. This cautionary theme concerning the pursuit of power at the expense of ethics is a poignant message in the era marked by rapid technological advancement. Despite its bleak depiction of social disparities, the film ultimately offers a message of hope. Frederick's transformation from a sheltered elite son to a mediator between social classes suggests the potential for personal growth and positive social change. It is a message that continues to inspire audiences to strive for better futures despite the challenges they face. The censorship and alterations made to the film both in Germany and internationally led to much of the film being lost for many decades. Distributors often edited the film to cater to a different audience and accommodate the political climate of the time. These alterations range from trimming the film's runtime to modifying its message, which influenced the film's interpretation. The film's complex history involved various cuts, edits, and reassemblies, leading to different versions circulating in different countries. The search for a complete and authentic Metropolis version became a subject of controversy among cinephiles and scholars. After the financial losses taken during the initial German theatrical run, the film's production company UFA found a new head in Alfred Hugenberg. Hugenberg ordered the film to be cut in order to begin to recoup some of the 5.3 million Reichmark budget. 
Ufa also had a standing deal with the American company Paramount, who also recut the film for release in the United States. This was particularly damaging because it was during those edits that unused footage was destroyed. Over the next decades, archivists would hunt for the lost footage, and it was not until 2008 that an almost intact copy was discovered in Argentina. Because of the editing problems, few critics saw the original film as Lang intended. Initial reviews of Metropolis were mixed, with critics and audiences voicing concerns about the film's narrative and themes. Some found the storytelling convoluted and heavy-handed, which affected its critical reception and commercial success. Despite being a pioneering work of art, the film faced challenges at the box office partly due to its extravagant production cost. It's always an interesting window into the past to look at some of the more negative original reviews. From Variety in 1927, quote, The producers have laid out a great deal of money on this picture, but it remains to be seen whether they will recoup. It's a gamble. No one has ever before seen a picture of such huge proportions. In its sheer hugeness, it can't help but impress, but its weakness lies in its story. They also state, quote, The weakness is in the scenario by Thea von Harbo. It gives effective chances for scenes, but it actually gets nowhere. The scene is laid a hundred years in the future, in the mighty city of Metropolis, a magnified New York, unquote. And from the New York Times from 1927, quote, What counts most, however, is that through all its disappointments and stumblings, through all its narrative confusions and loose ends, Metropolis remains a distinguished work of art. Kind of a mixed bag when it comes to reviews, though not entirely nasty like we'll get into in a few moments. But there were also some positive reviews as well. The New York Evening Post wrote, Every intelligent boy and girl in the country should see Metropolis. Time Magazine. The theme of the film, the keynote of which is the mediator between the brain and the hands must be the heart, is perfectly clear to anyone who has ever cracked a Bible or piloted an auto. Besides, the scenery is gorgeous. And then there was one review that still makes headlines today. H.G. Wells famously hated Metropolis and wrote about the film at length in the New York Times, and then wrote a novel, and then a screenplay adaptation of said novel as a counterpart to what Wells called the silliest film. And so it wouldn't be a discussion of Metropolis without highlighting some of Wells' reactions to the film. Some of my favorite quotes. Originality, there is none. Independent thought, none. He would also state, I may have missed some point of novelty, but I doubt it. And this, though, it must bore the intelligent man in the audience, makes the film all the more convenient as a gauge of the circle of ideas, the mentality from which it proceeded. Wells goes on to criticize everything from the cityscapes are out of date, the plane designs are dull, the machines don't actually do any work. But I truly love his quote, I am dismayed by the intellectual laziness it betrays. You truly must appreciate a great writer who takes pleasure in writing a highly critical review. I recommend reading it in its entirety, which I will link in the description. And in a few episodes, we'll discuss things to come. The film adaptation H.G. Wells wrote as a reaction to Metropolis. When I heard about Sam Esmail and Apple TV's proposed remake of Metropolis, I was immediately skeptical. The passion project from the Mr. Robot creator was supposed to be a television series version of the classic film, but was canceled in the summer of 2023, allegedly due to the large budget concerns and the writer's strike that was going on in Hollywood at the time. I'm not entirely opposed to remakes, sequels, or even prequels to a lesser degree. It can be fascinating to see how creators update science fiction stories for modern audiences. Arguably, Battlestar Galactica is the gold standard of sci-fi remakes, 
But I follow the old adage, just because you can doesn't mean you should. And the classic films deserve their due. And if Hollywood wants to tell their story, perhaps they should re-release classic films into theaters instead of remaking them. Many elements of Metropolis have an enduring legacy that lasts to today. So let's uncover some of the far-reaching influences that continue to captivate our imagination. The Science Fiction Renaissance Metropolis stands as a cornerstone of a genre that has shaped our vision of the future. It pioneered the portrayal of futuristic dystopias, advanced technology, and socio-political commentary, setting the stage for science fiction classics like Blade Runner and The Matrix. Its vision of a metropolis divided by towering skyscrapers and subterranean layers became an archetype for the genre, influencing masterpieces such as 1984 and Brazil. Robot and Android Motifs The film's creation of the Machinimensch, a lifelike robot, laid the foundation for cinematic explorations of artificial intelligence. Its influence reverberates through time in the form of replicants in Blade Runner and the poignant journey of C-3PO from Star Wars. Metropolis ignited our fascination with machines that blur the line between humanity and technology, a theme that continues to provoke philosophical inquiry and artistic expression. Social Commentary and Filmmaker Inspiration Beyond its visual splendor, Metropolis remains a profound commentary on social inequality and the dehumanizing effects of industrialization. Its message of unity and compassion amid division resonates in contemporary discussions of social justice. Directors like Ridley Scott, George Lucas, and James Cameron acknowledge the film's influence on their work. Its innovative techniques, visual storytelling, and thematic depth have inspired generations of filmmakers, leaving an indelible mark on the art of storytelling. Cultural Influence and Preservation Metropolis transcends the realm of cinema, imprinting its essence on art, literature, fashion, and music. Its iconic imagery and themes permeate these creative realms, transforming it into a symbol of artistic and intellectual exploration. The film's restoration and preservation efforts underscore the importance of safeguarding cinematic classics for future generations, rekindling our appreciation for the timeless beauty on the silver screen. Education and Analysis In academia, Metropolis is an essential component of film studies, a source of study for its groundbreaking cinematography, thematic depth, and visual storytelling techniques. It serves as a case study in the evolution of cinematic language, teaching aspiring filmmakers the art of storytelling through the lens. It is a dividing line between the sci-fi discussed from 1902 to 1926 and everything we will discuss in later episodes. Political science fiction as we know it today didn't quite find its footing until after the cataclysmic events of World War I. Before that, the realm of science fiction film was largely dominated by adaptations and even some remakes. Science fiction itself wasn't even a definitive genre, and it was often mixed with horror and fantasy. However, the war to end all wars changed everything, particularly in Germany and the Soviet Union. Personally, I see the film building upon the works of German Expressionist cinema as the dividing line between old-school sci-fi films and the beginnings of political sci-fi. This iconic work was born during a period of profound upheaval, so it is no surprise that Fritz Lang and Thea von Harbo would draw upon their own personal political ideologies to create the story. Metropolis doesn't shy away from the political consequences of social unrest and worker uprisings. But there are questions about whose political ideologies are more prevalent in the film. Director Fritz Lang or his wife and the film's screenwriter, Thea von Harbo. Her political beliefs were influenced by her association with the Nationalist Socialist German Workers' Party. 
aka the Nazi party in the early 1920s, though she didn't officially join the party until 1932. She leaned towards nationalism and authoritarian principles, which can be seen in her desire for a united society. Her script portrays the need for a mediator between the classes, but she also saw the need for strong authoritarian leadership for a prosperous society, as well as a hierarchical social structure with distinct roles for different classes. Harpa was also staunchly anti-communist, which would often critique any form of radicalism. The character of the robot Maria, who manipulates the workers into chaos, may symbolize her opposition to revolutionary and radical movements. The depiction of the elite's luxurious lifestyle and the portrayal of the workers' dire conditions can be seen as a means of conveying her political messages. It is important to note that both had creative differences, and their political and personal relationship eventually dissolved. Lang did not share her political leanings, and had a more nuanced and empathetic approach to the film's themes and characters. While her political influence is evident in the script, Metropolis remains a complex and layered work with contributions from both creators. But Lang's own political ideologies played a role in the film's deeper meanings. Born in Austria, his Jewish descent influenced his personal life more than his film subjects. But in his filmmaking, he demonstrated a willingness to engage with political themes in his films, a stance that would often put him at odds with the rising Nazi party in Germany during the 1930s. Lang wanted to discuss class struggle and societal inequality within a dystopian landscape, which mirrored the anxieties during the Weimar Republic period. Lang's initial distance from overtly political cinema shifted as his career progressed. In the early 1920s, his film, Dr. Mabuza the Gambler, subtly alluded to the political anxieties of the Weimar Republic, particularly the political chaos and economic instability. However, it was with Metropolis that his political undertones became more pronounced. The film offered a powerful commentary on class struggle and industrialization, reflecting the social and political tensions of the time. His 1933 film, the Testament of Dr. Mabuza was banned by the Nazi party because it might, quote, incite people to antisocial behavior and terrorism against the state. Lang's disagreements with the Nazi party came to the forefront when they came to power in the early 1930s. As a filmmaker known for his outspoken and critical work, he was a natural target for censorship. Lang's wife added a layer of complexity to the situation. She was a talented screenwriter who had collaborated with Lang on several films, including Metropolis, Woman on the Moon, and M. The ideological divide between the couple was significant, ultimately leading to their divorce in 1933. Lang tells the dramatic story of his flight from Germany after an alleged meeting with Joseph Goebbels. We have no proof other than Lang's word that this story is true. So one day I got an invitation, meaning an order, to arrive at the Ministry of Propaganda. The story goes that Goebbels called Lang into his office and Lang believed it was because of his banned film. But it turned out to be quite the opposite. I was waiting and he spoke and spoke and suddenly he said, the Führer has seen your films. He didn't see which one. Mm -hmm. And then he said, and he has said, this is the man who will give us the national socialistic film. Goebbels was willing to overlook Lang's Jewish heritage and hire him as a director. Lang saw the writing on the wall and fled Germany. He eventually found his way to the United States, where his career would continue until the early 1960s, and he passed away in 1976. Initially, I was going to dedicate an entire Spotlight episode on the evolution of sound in film, but then I found the YouTube channel 100 Years of Cinema and his fantastic video on the subject. 
the episode 1927, The Jazz Singer, How Movies Learn to Talk, covers the beginning of the sound era in film, and he does it in less than eight minutes. So I'll link the video in the description if you would like to check it out. This is the year two iconic films, Metropolis and The Jazz Singer, emerged, leaving an indelible mark on the history of cinema, but in distinctly different ways. 1927 may have marked the pinnacle of the silent era for science fiction film, but it also marked the beginning of the sound era for mass audiences. Experimentations with sound would go back to 1894 with the Dixon Sound Experiments. Inventors continued to work on adding sound to film into the 1920s. Audiences got to finally see the results with The Jazz Singer. It is hailed as the first talkie. The film only introduced some musical numbers and a few lines of spoken dialogue. But it was enough to become a huge hit and ignite a new era of filmmaking. The film's fusion of music, dialogue, and narrative resonated with audiences making it a massive box office hit and demonstrating the commercial viability of sound in film. The Jazz Singer didn't just change the way films were made, it transformed Hollywood. It led studios to transition from silent to sound filmmaking, necessitating the development of sound recording technologies and sound departments in studios. Moreover, it showcased the cultural significance of popular music and the emergence of American cultural landscape, celebrating the diversity of musical traditions. Wonderful pals are always hard to find. Metropolis, though a commercial failure at the time, is now celebrated for its visual and artistic contributions, impacting the aesthetics of cinema and the science fiction genre. The jazz singer, on the other hand, a commercial success at the time, is not as well known today. It is heralded for its introduction of synchronized sound, which forever changed the way stories were told on film and reshaped the industry. Together, these films represent the dynamic period of transition from silent to sound cinema. During 1927, there were several notable science fiction novels, short stories, and pulp magazine publications. Science fiction authors were actively exploring speculative themes that mirrored the zeitgeist of the era. This surge of creativity within the realm of written science fiction not only contributed to the genre's evolution, but also forged a strong link between science fiction in literature and its cinematic counterpart. It's worth noting that some of these literary works, beyond their influence on the genre itself, found their way into the world of feature films, either as direct adaptations or as sources of inspiration for future sci-fi cinematic ventures. The Mastermind of Mars by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Part of Burroughs' Princess of Mars series, this novel continues the adventures of John Carter on the Red Planet. It explores themes of advanced technology and alien civilization. It was published in Amazing Stories in 1927 and in hardcover form the following year. If the film John Carter from 2012 would have been successful, we could have seen an adaptation of this work in the series. The Garin Death Ray by Alexei Tolstoy, also known as The Death Box. This follow-up to Tolstoy's more famous novel Alita, which became the film Alita, Queen of Mars, was released. A scientist's creation of a deadly weapon sparks a perilous international struggle highlighting the dangers of unchecked scientific progress and political power. A Soviet film adaptation was released in 1965 and a four-part television series in 1973. Night of the Galactic Railroad by Kenji Miyazawa. This is a Japanese story of two young boys who embark on a mystical journey on a celestial train, going through the galaxy, encountering various allegorical experiences and deep philosophical themes. As they navigate the night sky, the story reflects on life, death, and the human condition, leaving readers with a profound exploration of existence 
and the Universe. The novel was adopted into a manga in 1983 and an anime in 1985. No part of history exists in a vacuum. Culture, history, science, the arts, and even film are influenced by, as well as influence the course of history. And so when looking at science fiction films of any time, it is important to understand what else was going on in the world. And so for the rest of this episode, I would like to look at some historical, cultural, and cinematic events that occurred in 1927. To begin, let's delve into the captivating historical events that shaped this era, leaving an indelible mark on society. Charles Lindbergh's Transatlantic Flight On May 20th to the 21st, Charles Lindbergh became the first person to fly solo nonstop across the Atlantic Ocean. He flew from Roosevelt Field in New York to Le Bourget Field in Paris, France, in his plane, the Spirit of St. Louis. The Great Mississippi Flood of 1927. In the spring and early summer, the Mississippi River experienced one of the most devastating floods in U.S. history. The flood affected multiple states and displaced hundreds of thousands of people, leading to significant economic, racial, and social repercussions. Introduction of the Ford Model A. On December 2nd, the Ford Motor Company introduced the Ford Model A, replacing the iconic Model T. The Model A was a significant success and marked a new era for the automotive industry. Leon Trotsky was banished from the Soviet Communist Party. Soviet leader Joseph Stalin expelled Leon Trotsky from the Communist Party due to political disagreements. Trotsky, a prominent Bolshevik revolutionary, was a thorn in Stalin's side, and this solidified Stalin's power and eliminated any significant political opposition. Trotsky would be assassinated while in exile in Mexico in August 1940. The cultural landscape of this time was marked by several events and developments, some of which carry a lasting impact into today. Babe Ruth makes baseball history. Legendary New York Yankee Babe Ruth achieved one of the most remarkable seasons in baseball history by hitting 60 home runs in a single season, a record that stood for nearly 40 years. Radio Broadcasting Radio was becoming an increasingly influential medium in 1927, providing a platform for news, entertainment, and music. It played a pivotal role in shaping cultural taste and disseminating information. The Rise of Musical Theater Broadway musicals were thriving in 1927. One of the most notable productions of the year was Showboat, composed by Jerome Kern with lyrics by Oscar Hammerstein. Showboat is considered a landmark in the history of American musical theater. Phonograph records and radios These new forms of media were becoming more accessible, allowing people to enjoy recorded music at home. The accessibility contributed to the popularity of jazz and popular music. And lastly, the scientific events and discoveries in 1927 that contributed to the advancement of knowledge in various fields. They continue to influence creators of science fiction, as well as scientific research and technological developments to this day. The Great Debate in Astronomy In April 1927, astronomers Harlow Shapley and Heber Curtis engaged in a famous debate at the Smithsonian Museum of Natural History in Washington, D.C. The debate centered on the scale of the universe, with Shapley arguing for the Milky Way at the center and Curtis advocating for the existence of other galaxies beyond the Milky Way. The Solvay Conference on Electrons and Photons In October 1927, The fifth Solvay Conference was held in Brussels, Belgium. This conference brought together leading physicists, including Albert Einstein, Niels Bohr, Werner Heisenberg, and Erwin Schrödinger, to discuss quantum mechanics and the nature of light. The Birth of Information Theory American mathematician and engineer Claude Shannon published his master's thesis titled A Symbolic Analysis of Relay and Switching Circuits. This laid the foundation for information theory, which would later become essential in the development of modern communication and computing. 
Heisenberg's Uncertainty Principle. Formulated by physicist Werner Heisenberg, it asserts that it is impossible to simultaneously know the exact position and momentum of a subatomic particle with complete certainty. While abstract and theoretical, it has practical implications in modern technology, including the development of innovations like electron microscopes, lasers, and advances in information theory, which ultimately impact our daily lives and technological advancements. When discussing science fiction films from 1927, it's essential to consider the broader context of non-science fiction films in that year. Non-genre films of 1927 that came out of mostly Hollywood and the American film industry can offer valuable insights into the cinematic techniques, artistic innovations, and cultural trends that influenced and shaped filmmaking during this time. Each film contributed to the history of cinema. And though this channel is primarily about science fiction, I do want to highlight some of the non-science fiction films of the year. Wings. Directed by William A. Wellman, Wings is a silent war film that won the first Academy Award for Best Picture at the inaugural ceremony in 1929. It is known for its spectacular aerial combat sequences and the brilliant tracking shot in a nightclub. Sunrise, a song of two humans. Directed by F.W. Murnau, Sunrise is often considered one of the greatest silent films ever made. It tells a romantic and emotional story with stunning cinematography and innovative techniques. It, starring Clara Bow and directed by Clarence G. Badger, it was a silent romantic comedy that helped popularize the term it Girl, and made Clara Bow an iconic figure of the Roaring Twenties. Napoleon, directed by Abel Gantz, Napoleon is a French silent epic historical film known for its innovative cinematic techniques and grand scale. The Passion of Joan of Arc, directed by Carl Theodore Dreyer, this silent film is a masterpiece of early cinema. Rene Jean Falconetti's portrayal of Joan of Arc is considered one of the greatest performances in film history. October 10 Days That Shook the World Directed by Sergei Eisenstein, this silent Soviet historical film dramatizes the events of the October Revolution in Russia. It is notable for its innovative editing and montage techniques. The technical innovations made during this time were increasing at an ever-rapid pace. Experiments in sound, radio, and television were conducted at this time. Some major technical innovations include the first demonstration of television. American inventor and engineer Philo Farnsworth conducted the first successful demonstration of an all-electronic television system on September 7, 1927. The press was presented with this scientific breakthrough on January 13, 1928, where it headlined in a few nationwide papers. This marked a significant step in the development of modern television technology. The Formation of the Columbia Broadcasting System In 1927, the Columbia Broadcasting System was formed when a group of radio stations, led by William S. Paley, came together under the United Independent Broadcasters Network, which later evolved into CBS, becoming one of the major broadcasting networks in the United States. The Invention of Magnetic Tape Audio Recording System In 1927, Fritz Flomer, a German engineer, invented the magnetic tape audio recording system, which marked a significant advancement in audio recording technology and laid the foundation for modern magnetic tape recording. Starting in 1927, science fiction underwent a transformative period marked by increased creativity, the late 1920s through the 1930s set the stage for the proliferation of imaginative films that we will see in the 1950s and beyond. Notable contributions include King Kong, Woman in the Moon, and Things to Come, as well as the mixing of sci-fi with unexpected genres like musicals, exemplified by Just Imagine, in 1930. This era also witnessed the divergence of horror as a distinct genre 
with the advent of universal monsters like Frankenstein and Dracula. But science fiction as we know it today would not be here without the contributions of Fritz Lang and the cast and crew of Metropolis, as well as the cinephiles, archivists, filmmakers, and documentarians who work so hard to preserve and rediscover Lang's monumental work. Today, science fiction films continue to captivate audiences with their imaginative storytelling and groundbreaking visuals, all while building upon the legacy established by the pioneering film of 1927. In a few short years, we will celebrate the 100th anniversary of this remarkable film. If possible, please try to watch this on the biggest screen possible to appreciate its grandeur. But just to let you know, there are several versions of the film available on YouTube, as well as DVD and Blu-ray. The controversies, challenges, and triumphs associated with Metropolis have only added to its mystique and cultural significance. From censorship and political interpretations to its rediscovery and restoration, the film's journey is a microcosm of the evolving landscape of cinema and society. Thank you so much for watching. Please remember to like, comment, and subscribe for future videos about the history of science fiction cinema. In the next episode, I'll close out this fascinating decade with the sci-fi films of 1928 and 1929.